Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. For more than 50 years, Wild Kingdom explored wildlife and our natural world. Tonight's episode, and many others, focus on the timeless value of wildlife conservation. Wild Kingdom played a critical role in changing public attitudes about the importance of animals for the health of our planet and our own quality of life. We challenge viewers to learn about animals and get involved in conservation in their local communities. That call to action resulted in more visits to local zoos, nature preserves, and even observing animals in their natural habitats. And that connection with animals benefits all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by the company with coverage for everyone. From the beautiful and world-famous St. Louis Zoological Gardens, here is the director of the zoo, Marlon Perkins. Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Jim and I have been going over a few postcards we've received recently from some of our globetrotting friends. What's that one, Jim? Well, this is from a friend of mine in Africa. Here's one for you, Pete. You're having a wonderful time, wish you were here. <laughs> I think old Pete would just as soon stay right here in the zoo where living's a little bit easier. Pete is a woolly monkey. He's with us today because he comes from the Amazon jungle region of South America. And that's where we're going. Now, I like to send postcards home as well as the next fellow. But when you're traveling around to the Amazon jungle, you just don't find too many souvenir stands where you can buy postcards marked Greetings from Amazonia. So we prepared what you might call a living postcard. We put our greetings on movie film. And right now, I'd like to deliver to you that postcard. It's postmarked Leticia, Amazonas, Colombia. Hello. It's a real thrill to be able to greet you from the shore of the Amazon River. I'm standing on the soil of Colombia. Directly across the river is Peru. And down the river, just a few miles, is Brazil. This is indeed the land of adventure. This is Perico Ligero, the three-toed sloth, a native of these jungles. You rarely see one of these three-toed sloths in any of the North American zoos because of his specialized feeding habits. He feeds almost entirely on the leaves of the pawpaw tree. They're pretty difficult to see when hanging in a pawpaw tree because of these unusual camouflage markings. You know, these animals are so slow that during the rainy season, green moss actually grows in their hair, making them even more difficult to see. We find that three-toed sloths are quite common in this area. A rarer sight is a two-toed sloth. Although he's somewhat more dexterous than his cousin, he still prefers generally to see things upside down. And you can see that this troop of spider monkeys is really at home in the high-rise apartments of the rainforest. The cafeteria is open all the time, and this capuchin monkey has selected a delicious guava. Another fellow with a sweet tooth for guava is the kinkajou. He's Mr. Raccoon down in these parts. You have to look up to see him. Looking down one day, I came upon a nest of sharp-toothed snakes hatching. The baby makes its way out of the egg by slitting the leathery shell with its egg tooth. With a little perseverance, I counted 56 baby snakes. Well, Jim, that's my postcard. I'd say it's more like one of those souvenir folders, Marlon, but I could add a bit to it. My postcard would be marked British Guiana. It would read, 
This morning, I went canoeing with a couple of my friends, exploring some of the narrow streams that wind through the jungle. Just as we came out into a clearing, I spotted a young tapir. The light spots on his ears disappear when he's about six months old. The distinctive feature of a tapir is his snout. It's like a sawed off elephant's trunk, and he uses it somewhat the same way that an elephant does. This has earned him the nickname of Elephant of the New World, although actually he's closer kin to the rhino. He never ventures too far from the water because he's a better swimmer than a runner. And when danger threatens, he heads for the water. I had an idea that I might like to bring this one home with me. But he was too fast. I figured that other tapers might be somewhere near, so I went looking. My plan was to suddenly surprise one so he would run into the water where I might be able to lasso him. As we edged along near the bank, I spotted one standing in shallow water just around the bend. I noticed that he wasn't acting right, and soon I saw that he had some fresh wounds on his back, probably from an encounter with a jaguar. My friends said that I was no match for a full-grown taper, but I calculated that his wounds may have left him a little weak. is being weak. It was all I could do to keep him from getting into deep water. I yelled for a second rope. It would take two of us to hold this guy. The paper's neck is such that it's easy for a rope to slip off over its head. So to be sure I had him, I finally got one rope hitched around his back. made for the water to escape. I expected that, but I didn't expect him to perform the alligator twist. After we got him up on the bank, I could see that this guy weighed at least 400 pounds, and we found that his wounds weren't really very serious. Jim, your taper is indeed the largest land mammal native to South America and a slippery one to catch. However, when I went to the Amazon, I was interested in catching the largest snake, the anaconda, and I wanted a really big one. Despite their large size, they keep themselves well concealed. One day, however, as I was tramping along the bank of the river with Ross Allen and Jim Hurlbut, I spotted an anaconda track. A track that size is easy to follow, and that's what we did. He led us through the swamp, and when we caught up with him, I judged he must be at least 17 or 18 feet long. plan was for Ross to move ahead of him, then grab him by the neck while Jim and I moved in from behind to back up Ross. Then the battle was on. Take it easy, Ross. Take your time now. Hang on, Ross. He's getting away from us. He's gotten around my leg. Oh, we'll just have to coil him up in there. Hold him 
sack. Pull the sack open. There you are. We were all more than a little winded, but we had 175 pounds of live anaconda to show for our work. He was too heavy for one man to carry, so we improvised a litter of saplings and jungle vine and marched our prize safely back to camp. Marla and I still find a snake that large to be almost unbelievable. And I think little Pete here agrees with me. But even though all the animals of the Amazon are fascinating, to me, the people that live there are even more so. Their habits, their customs, the way they survive, there's enough material to fill many books. There's one thing I must say, and that is that the Indians taught me a real lesson. They live with danger every day and survive only as long as they don't get sick or hurt. Well, the way they live, Jim, made me realize how lucky we are that we can protect ourselves with Mutual of Omaha health insurance. I met many Indian families on the Amazon. This is a Yagua Indian family. They have basic needs just like ours. They must provide food, clothing, and shelter for their family. They face many problems that we do because we're both subject to many unexpected dangers. But here's where the similarity ends. If the Indians are sick or hurt, they're in real trouble. Even though witch doctors can try to cure them, they're usually unsuccessful. I know you must have seen a porcupine and know what they look like, but I wonder if you've ever seen one like this. This is a prehensile-tailed porcupine, and that pretty well marks him as a tree dweller. You know, with all those animals living in that forest in the jungle of South America, there must be rather frequent encounters. What happens when these animals meet? Well, let's see. Jim, bring in that other tree dweller. Here you go, Pete. What do you think of him, huh? <laughs> he gets <laughs> right up close, doesn't he? Yeah, they don't bother each, each other at all. No, they must have encountered each other before. When animals meet, the results are not always the same. Jim and I have witnessed this many times in the Amazon jungle. One sure thing, though, is an encounter between a tamandua and termites. The tamandua is the middle-sized anteater. He has sharp, powerful claws for tearing off the bark to get at his favorite food, termites. Then he puts his long, sticky tongue to work, lapping them up. Being so well equipped, he's a sure winner over the termites. But often, Marlin, the issue's in doubt. I was watching this jungle rat, the biggest one I ever saw, more than a foot long. He didn't seem to notice, but there was a racer snake in the water. Now, of course, snakes are the classic enemies of rats, and rats eat just about anything, including snakes. Both of these, though, normally feed on smaller animals. The rat seemed too frightened to attack, and the snake made only a half-hearted strike, then moved on to look for smaller game. Overhead was a young ocelot, who might have been a match for either of them, but he didn't seem interested. Being one of the smaller cats, he's known locally as Little Tiger. Sharing the tree with him at the moment was an unlikely companion, an opossum, seemingly half animal and half tail, 
The opossum has his own marvelous ways of maneuvering through the trees. There was no contest here. They just seemed to peacefully ignore each other. But there was nothing peaceful about these tyras. They had hunted out a colony of frogs and were having themselves a banquet. Tyras are South American weasels, and in farming areas, they prey upon the poultry just as their North American cousins do. Jim, I've seen many encounters between animals, some peaceful and some savage. But the one that stands out most vividly in my memory is one that few men have ever witnessed, and that we were fortunate enough to record on film. Moving through the jungle, we came upon a ferdilance. Now, the ferdilance is highly venomous, but there's one animal that's immune to its poison, and that's another snake, the musurana. The musurana is called a cannibal snake because it lives by eating other snakes. So here, before our eyes, is one of the great dramas of the jungle. time a jaguar lay nearby paying no attention. Her only concern was for her kittens. Playing around the base of a giant saiba tree, they look so small and cuddly, you're inclined to forget how quickly they grow up to become the most ferocious inhabitant of the jungle. Cute as those kittens are, we can sure add the jaguar to a long list of animals that our peace-loving friends here wouldn't like to encounter. Yes, Jim, that's true. But even though those animals avoid the jaguar, occasionally they meet, and the results can be tragic. The same thing is true of people. There are many things, like sickness and accident, that we try to avoid, but it's inevitable that we sometimes encounter them. And here again, the results can be tragic if we don't have adequate health insurance from Mutual of Omaha. Oh, Pete, we're not going to let him hurt you. <laughs> he's, he's not taking any chances. I have another animal from the jungles of South America, a boa constrictor. Let me ask you, how would you like to have one of these as a pet? Well, many of the Indians do. Now, I've been asked to judge many a pet parade here at home. But the most unlikely pet parade I ever judged was on the bank of the Amazon River. We journeyed 40 miles downriver into Brazil to a Tacuna Indian village. The Tacunas are primarily fishermen rather than hunters. From long contact with Western man, they've adopted modern dress, but otherwise they live an essentially primitive existence. The women are quite industrious. The men, however, seem to have little ambition. And the kids, well, like kids everywhere, they play. Our guide this day was Mike Tzalikas from the Tarpon Springs Zoo in Florida. The Indians of this village know Mike because they've trapped animals for him. But today, the youngsters had gathered to show us their pets. And we had a wonderful time looking over the animals and talking with the children. Marlin, are you all set? All set, Mike. Well, here we come. Oh, here comes an old friend of mine. Jim, do you recognize this monkey? Oh, looks like one of the little fellows back home. It is. This is a ring-tailed capuchin, ring-tailed monkey. 
sometimes used as an organ grinder monkey. Well, thank you very much, Alberto, for bringing him in to see us. Thank you. See you a little later. What's next, Mike? We have a most unusual pet, Marlon. Oh, hey, isn't that a mata mata, Marlon? It certainly is, and I agree with you, Mike. This is a most unusual pet. Well, I don't think there's a boy in all the United States that has a turtle as a grotesque as this one. Is that a, sn a snorkel tube up there? Yeah, right here, Jim. This is his nose, and he just sticks the end of that above the surface of the water to get a breath of air. And here are some filaments all around here that the turtle waves underwater to attract fish his way. Thank you very much. Marlon, here we have a very small boy with a very large pet. Say, I recognize that one all right. That's a red-tailed boa. And you're right, that is a pretty big pet for such a small boy. Let's see how big it is. Oh, man, look at there. That's about twice as tall as that boy. That's quite a snake to have at home. Ask this boy what his name is, will you? Como se chama você, huh? Pedro. Pedro. And sit, sit right, no, sit over there. I think it's better. Say, here's our old friend, the vacuum cleaner. Come over here and sit me, next to me with your animal. Now, I'd like to show you the action of that vacuum cleaner nose on this Coatimundi. I got a piece of bread here. I'm gonna break off a little piece and break it up into small pieces here. And I'll cover his eyes up so that he can't see it. But uh, now let's see if he can find it. <laughs> he can smell it all right. There he goes. In his pocket for sure. Well, he's a nice, gentle animal at this age, which is about half grown. But I'll bet you when he gets to be full grown, he's not going to be carrying this animal around on his shoulder. He'd be too mean and too rough. You sit right there by him, Mr. Perkins, and let him see if he can see your pet. Where is it, Mom? Well, this is a piece of bread. That's Fine, not a yeah. pet. Well, you better look a little higher. Oh, for <laughs> heaven's <laughs> sakes, look here in her hair. Marmoset, isn't it? Yes, it's a little white-lipped marmoset. Obrigada. That means thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have a very nice young caper here today, Marlon. Oh, he is a nice young one. Who does he belong to? Belongs to this little boy here. His name is Juan. Well, Juan, that is a nice pet. You know, we won't have time to see all the children with their pets today, but there's one more fellow I just have to talk to. The little weeping capuchin. How do you do? Oh, for goodness sake. Let's put him over like this, huh? Like this. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't bite too hard now. I want you back to the same position you were in a minute ago. What are you talking? You speaking Spanish or Portuguese? I don't think you're speaking either of those. I think you're talking Capuchin talk. Oh, my. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, ain't you a great little kid. Oh, I wouldn't mind having you for a pet myself. Mike, we've certainly seen a lot of most interesting animals here today. Interesting children, too. I'm glad it's not up to me to pick a winner. And for the little boy with a high-flying curacao, here's a When the time came to judge the pet parade, we awarded prizes to everyone. Now, this seemed not only fair, but with the Indians outnumbering us 100 to 1, it was the only politic thing to do. I can only agree, Marlon. That's one of the unlikeliest pet parades in history. Probably so. I guess that's because the Amazon jungle holds the unlikeliest animals. Jim, you know, lots of kids around here keep wild animals as pets. Frogs, toads, raccoons, even skunks. So it's natural for the Indians to keep monkeys, parrots, or boa constrictors. I suppose we better put that boa away or we'll never get Pete back. As a pet, this would scare most kids in this country to death. Yeah, I guess so. 
But you know, the Indians know what they're doing because they live with the animals. Journeying into the Amazon jungle is like journeying back in time, back before man took over so much of the land for his farms and cities, before he took to labeling animals as friend or enemy and began ruthlessly exterminating those he called enemies, thereby upsetting the delicate balance which nature had achieved. On all the face of the earth today, the only extensive area where that balance is preserved unspoiled is the great tropical rainforest. Here, where there is room for all and food for all, man and beast share a pattern of coexistence. There is conflict, of course. Animals sensing danger attack men, and men needing food kill animals. But still there is a natural relationship a way of life dating back to antiquity. Here and here only can we study life as it was when all of the earth was, in fact, the wild kingdom. The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.